When, when China, quote, reopened, it was all this optimism that demand was going to boom. That's not how it's going to be. How do you see China playing out the year? Right now, I mean, indeed, what I'm hearing here, Brian, is that, that in fact, on the commodity side, it is bouncing back faster than people would have thought. And so, you know, as you say, the China rebound is going to be a big factor that could tighten what is right now an oversupplied oil market in the first half of the year and an oil market that's tighter in the second half of the year. Yeah, and, and when you say tighter, could that be tighter by 500,000 barrels a day, Dan, or could that be two to three million barrels a day? Because the world's got the former. Yeah. I don't know if the world has the latter. Yeah. Well, of course, what's really weighing on the world oil market today is what's happening uh, with interest rates. And when I look at our PMIs, which measure you know, business looking forward, not back, you do see a uh, continuing slowing in business activity. You also see inflation weakening faster than people thought. So I think in the first half of the year, you still have uh, uh, the G GDP, the interest rates really weighing. But then as we move into the second half is when you start to see the rebound or the expectation of a rebound. And by that point, China should be resurgent again because they've finally just, you know, as you said, they've scrapped the, the COVID policy and uh, it's kind of chaotic effect. But already one is hearing here, at least, that the, co that the waves of COVID have already passed through Shanghai and Hong Kong. Yeah. In fact, some of the data is starting to come down. Thank goodness. Dan, doing this as long as you have, can you explain to our viewers and me as well, what the impact of higher rates and currency moves is on the price of oil? Because we talk so much about demand and supply and OPEC. But to your point, monetary and fiscal policy also matters. How much? Well, I think monetary and fiscal policy matter a lot. And at the end of the day, I think GDP wins out. And really, I, I say there are really two people who are really setting the price of oil right now. One is Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Fed, uh, metaphorically speaking, and Xi Jinping, uh, the president of China. But I think that uh, I think <clears throat> GDP wins out in, in, the, in the end. That's what, what we've seen again and again. And uh, that's where we are in oil prices. But once uh, demand really comes back, then you're back still in that issue of uh, uh, underinvestment in, in supplies in a tighter market. Yeah, and, and we talked about it earlier. I don't know if you were kind of – I know how the set works there, Dan. Maybe you kind of heard the interview with Stephen Pagluka of Bain at the top of the show or not. But we talked a little bit about the lack of incentive or desire to invest in oil and gas projects in the United States by private equity and Wall Street. And when I look at the Permian, and there's all this talk about the Permian's boom days are behind it simply because while it still is an amazing oil field, the money – to pull the oil out of the ground simply is not there. Do you, do you agree with that? Or can the Permian have a second you know, well, sort of resurgence? Well, I mean, we're, what, at 12.3 million barrels a day. So by far, the U.S. is still the world's largest oil producer. But the message, you, and that you hear it, Brian, all the time from the producers, is capital discipline, that they have to return more capital. And right now, what, what, the supply chain problems that afflict so much of the world economy definitely there in terms of uh, oil and gas production, in terms of crews and so forth. And inflation is at work in the oil field, too. Costs are going up. So those are holding it back. But it is continuing to grow. And the, you know, but it's just not growing at the kind of rate we've seen in the past. But I think we're going to see continual growth over the year.